If in games involving fortune, my psychiatrist friend Reginald Gardner adhered to the principle that one must win back, he was, with few exceptions, interested only in the rules in games on a purely intellectual basis. Once he had mastered the rules of a new game, the doctor quickly lost interest. He had little enthusiasm for the game. We finished our game of Japanese chess that evening, and then I offered Gardner tea. As always, I expected to learn something extraordinary from him, but at first the doctor confined himself to meager and insignificant remarks. For my part, I told him about my visit to the post office, where an exceptionally chatty clerk served. He seems to be able to talk endlessly, I said with a chuckle. Instead of answering, Gardner fell silent. It might have been considered a humorous response, but I noticed him flinch and a wrinkle cross his forehead. I knew it only appeared when I remembered something extremely unpleasant. Talking endlessly, what a strange turn of phrase, the doctor said at last. And naturally, it should not be taken literally. It's just hyperbole, a stylistic device. If I could take it that way, what do you mean? A story happened to me at Denbridge Hospital, Gardner said uncertainly. He pondered for a few seconds. It happened quite a long time ago, so I'm not sure that my memory retains all the details exactly. So the standard formula was said. I performed my part of our introductory ritual and waited for the narration. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. There has never been a shortage of patients at Denbridge Asylum. This is rather odd, considering that our institution is far from the big cities, where it would seem that all the lunatics of the country should be concentrated. Nevertheless, even in our backwoods I had to deal with a great number and great variety of mental disorders. Aggressive patients required special care, murderers, sophisticated torturers, sexual maniacs. However, that case stood apart, even though there were no socially dangerous manifestations in it. The patient, a resident of a quiet suburban town, was brought to the clinic by his relatives. According to them, he had been talking incessantly for several hours almost half a day since the previous midnight, or rather, mumbling something unintelligible. I wrote down in the duty book the name and home address of the new patient and the preliminary diagnosis, which I defined as neurotic disorder, probably a trance colloquially called obsession. There was a loss of both a sense of personal identity and full awareness of the surrounding reality. The first attempt to apply the simplest and most universal sedatives was unsuccessful, but so far there was no cause for serious alarm. The patient was placed in a room with those autistic patients who could not be disturbed by his dull mumbling. I wondered, what was the cause of the disorder? There was obviously no traumatic brain injury or post-concussion syndrome. The suggestion of drugs was denied by the relatives. Other possible causes required an in-depth study. That's what I did in the evening of the same day. More detailed conversation with the relatives of the patient enlarged my picture of him. It turned out that this man was fond of spiritualism and other forms of occultism. In my personal medical journal I called him occultist. The information I received gave me grounds to use the language of detectives to consider the case almost closed. I had no doubt that the psychosis arose from irrepressible spiritualism. Psychiatric science knows of innumerable such cases. This information, however, made no practical sense in terms of a cure. But, I must admit, most of the patients at Denbridge Asylum did not return to normal. Our skills and efforts were sufficient only to restrain and maintain the most violent psychopaths and to prepare the relatives of other patients for their home care. I hoped that sooner or later the attack would subside due to the body's defensive reaction. He has to get water and food. If this does not happen, I will have to experiment with more radical medications. The next morning, when I arrived at the clinic, I was met by a concerned nurse on duty. She said that the new patient was still talking constantly for over a day. She was especially surprised that he showed no signs of fatigue. It was no longer just strange, and for the first time I felt a pang of fear. The first in a long chain. At the end of the second day of the attack, I no longer thought that this trivial definition applied here the patient's condition had not changed. Now it was not the fact that he was uttering unintelligible words with a regularity worthy of a better metronome that attracted our attention we might say, 
we became accustomed to it. What was staggering was that, despite such a long period of absence of water and food, he looked physically quite healthy, and one of my colleagues noticed that the patient had not grown any stubble. Running ahead, I would say that what struck us most about this patient was the actual cessation of most of his vital functions. Apart from the fact that he drank and ate nothing, his hair and nails did not grow and all natural reactions to external stimuli were absent. His metabolism seemed to have stopped. The only thing that did not cease was his airy muttering, which was depressing and terrifying to everyone around him. Strangely enough, even the most hopelessly autistic. After a couple of weeks no one but me wanted to take care of him. He was moved to a small storeroom in the attic, where only me and one of the orderlies, a hardened opiate addict, came to visit him. It is unfortunate to tell me about this kind of person serving in our clinic, but apparently they are needed for special cases. I don't know though I can guess how the orderly endured these visits, but I came up with the idea of using earplugs, which I made from wax-soaked pieces of absorbent cotton. It helped, at least for a while. Soon the outlandish patient was almost forgotten or, at least, preferred not to be discussed, except that one of my colleagues, who had once served in India, said that he had seen many such miracles in that country. I could not but agree with his conclusion. Our ideas about the capabilities of the human psyche and body need a serious revision, but we were still of the opinion that this incomprehensible case had a potential explanation by some not yet known natural factors. After a while I was far from sure of this. I had the idea of recording the patient's speech on a gramophone and trying to decode it myself or with the help of qualified specialists. I borrowed a gramophone from a colleague he also taught me how to use it, and some records I bought in a store. At first the recording process seemed to go well, but then I was amazed to see the gramophone start to tremble and the records start to melt. Within seconds, the seven-inch disc turned into a shapeless lump of tar, which then began to disintegrate into red-hot drops that burned through the gramophone case. I was particularly shaken by the disgusting unnaturalness of what was happening. Of course, I had to reimburse my colleague for the cost of the ruined gramophone, and at the same time to listen to the usual reproaches in such situations. But this did not bother me at all. It would have been foolish to get upset over such insignificant things in the face of truly extraordinary events. Having failed with the acoustic recording, I decided on a simpler though evidently less revealing in terms of the result method of recording the occultist speech in letters. Of course, I was aware of the low value of this form of recording, but there was nothing else I could do. Besides, I relied on the intelligence of the experts I knew in the field of unusual phenomena with whom I was going to consult. Recognizing the sounds in the monotonous muttering was very difficult. It was even more difficult to write them down in the letters of our, frankly, rather poor alphabet. After filling out a few sheets of paper, I went over them and made sure that I did not see anything that I even slightly perceived as making sense structures, systems, etc. Then I called some friends and made an appointment. I should note that these people, of whom I have already spoken several times, were also connected to the sphere of the occult but not as adepts and practitioners, but as specialists engaged in, shall we say, supervision. I wouldn't call their activities targeted opposition to the occult, but in some cases their help and advice did contribute to resistance to forces hostile to society or individuals. We met in London as always, in a house with a superb view of the Black Friars Bridge a very poignant curio. I gave all the details of the unpleasant incident at Denbridge Asylum, and offered to read my scrawled transcript. A discussion ensued, in the course of which our panel discussed various ways of deciphering the text assuming, of course, that it actually made sense, which none of us were sure it did. I quickly lost the thread of the discussion, felt tired and frustrated, did not understand my interlocutors, and generally fell into a state of prostration. I was brought out of it by the belated arrival of one of the most authoritative experts, the Elder, as we jokingly called him. He was a real bookworm, who had spent his entire conscious life in libraries including the inaccessible vaults of grimoires in London, Paris, Berlin, St. Petersburg, Washington, and other world metropolises. He studied the record through an old-fashioned ornette for a minute, 
and then said calmly that no transcript was needed. Why not? We exclaimed. Have you already found the solution of the text? On this subject, my friends, I will answer you with a wise saying of Confucius. It's hard to look for a black cat in a dark room, especially if it's not there. There is no cat that is, no meaning in the text. It's just a chaotic set of letters, and your patient speech, Gardner, is a chaotic set of sounds. I didn't know whether to be glad or sad. If speech doesn't make sense, then we're just dealing with a mental disorder, albeit in an extremely bizarre hypertrophied form. What about the gramophone? After a few minutes of silent reflection, one of the meeting participants asked, the focused effect of the body's electromagnetic radiation somehow stimulated and incredibly magnified? Your hypothesis is very reasonable, the elder agreed. The presence of energy of another nature and alien origin is also possible. But I don't consider the gramophone episode important. Be patient a little, gentlemen, and I will try to tell you something more important about this undoubtedly remarkable story. So the text itself makes no sense, but I understand the background of the tragedy, clear thanks to descriptions of several similar cases in very little known literature. Through the efforts of a number of influential people, none of them has been made public. Dr. Gardner, could you be more specific as to what kind of occult questions this man was interested in? I recall that his relatives spoke in passing of an interest in the subject of extending life to infinity. Our eminent expert nodded as a sign that he expected such an answer. After his defeat at the famous Battle of Gatton, the Templar Berengarius von Lutz was imprisoned by the Saracens and subsequently traveled to the remote depths of Asia. There he became acquainted with the forbidden magical sciences of ancient eras and civilizations, whose existence our official historiography, of course, does not recognize or rather, recognizes them as nothing more than myths. Returning home afterwards, von Lutz wrote a treatise that became, so to speak, a stern book and a guidebook for occultists who sought ways to overcome the fundamental laws of being. One of the most important and audacious goals of this quest was the attainment of eternal material life. Von Lutz's prescription demanded that the name of some entity be uttered aloud. To do so, it was necessary to read a witchcraft formula, which initiated a special process inside a person's consciousness. It can be defined as the dictation of this name by some extraneous or rather otherworldly force with which a strong and indissoluble mental connection was established. I am sure, Dr. Gardner, that your patient was not very literate in the field of the occult. This led him into a fatal delusion, for had his knowledge been deeper, he would have been wary of committing such a reckless act. The fact is that von Lutz's method is a monstrous trap. The one whose name is to be uttered is known to true connoisseurs who are not in the habit of sharing their knowledge widely as the unnameable or the unspeakable, or the unnamed. Faint hints in some hermetic texts associate it with a secluded cold place somewhere in the star cluster of the Hyades, as well as with the moon. Thus, the attempt to pronounce the unpronounceable turned out to be a vain and meaningless stream of sounds coming out of the mouth of an unwilling dummy. On the other hand, enchantment provided this pseudo-human with an unnatural physiological strength. The slave of the spell did not need food and according to some rumors, even air in this case the sounds were produced by vibrating his tongue and was preserved as it were. He fell into a kind of selective anbiosis parabiosis, if you will. One could consider that theoretically he acquired eternal life, but not, of course, the one he craved. And, most importantly, in practice, this ugly existence is by no means eternal since witchcraft does not provide absolute invulnerability to external dangers. I am afraid the story seemed too short for you and you want to know more. But I have to finish, because I have reached the limit of my professional secrecy. I beg your pardon, most gracious sovereigns, but I have certain obligations which compel me to observe a certain caution and secrecy. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Is he still sitting in the Denbridge Asylum attic? I asked, giving Gardner another cup of tea. In that case, I think I would have left the clinic a long time ago. After that meeting I made a colossal effort to go up to the attic and inquire about the occultist's condition on duty. 
It seemed as if an ominous voice with an inhuman rhythm had entered my head, and its black aura permeated the whole building. At times I wanted to do something to him to stop this madness. As for the ungodly orderly, he once told me that he intended to blow the hell out of that damned mummy, and I had no doubt that he would not hesitate to move on from words to deeds. Frankly, prevent it. Soon the orderly left the clinic, leaving a note, the contents of which I will not retell in view of the abundance of obscene language including that directed at me. The nurse on duty discovered that all the strychnine was missing. I immediately realized what it was and rushed to the attic. The dose that the orderly had injected into the babbling occultist would have been enough to put down a dozen lions. But he was still alive, though his body twitched convulsively, his tongue-bitten teeth clenched tight, and his muscles literally burst with tension. Instead of words, there were only hisses and sobs, rapidly weakening. The elder expert was right the spell did not offer absolute protection against fatal external influences. I had no desire to pr Finally, after a short time, the occultist, which had turned into a ruin of horrible appearance, fell silent. I was afraid to check if he was still alive. In any case, this natural notion had already lost its meaning with regard to him. A couple of hours later, an unprecedented storm broke out in our area you remember it.